To begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land that we meet on today and pay my respect to Elders past and present. Are observational studies obsolete? That's what we're here to debate today. And aren't we in for a treat with a very strong, two very strong teams? Good evening everyone, I'm Simon Wilcox, President of the New South Wales Branch of the Public Health Association of Australia. And tonight we are co-hosting this event with the Australasian Epidemiological Association. I'd like to introduce Robin Turner from the AEA, who will be my co-host tonight. We will both be hosting it together. And I'll hand over to Robin now, who will describe how the debate will work, and then we'll introduce our speakers and get underway. Thank you. So um, thank you all for coming tonight. Um, we're looking forward to this. We have a few simple rules and we're going to throw a bit of a curveball in as well for our speakers. <laughs> Gotta keep them on their toes. So each speaker has six minutes, um, which we'll strictly adhere to, and they'll get a warning, uh, ring of the warning bell with one minute to go, and then at six minutes it will just keep ringing. Um, <laughs> we've just, yeah, excellent. <laughs> We've decided that we need to have a little bit of audience participation as well. So after every pair of speakers, we might take a question from the audience as well, just to keep you on your toes. So think of those really great, important questions that you want to throw to the panels. So um, the affirmative team will go first, and then we'll alternate sides. And then at the end, there'll be a two-minute roundup from each speaker, from speaker one from each team, just to really win you over with their final <laughs> arguments. And last but not least, the audience, you guys have the biggest role of all. You get to decide the winner. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> Sounds a little bit more excited. <laughs> That's better, thank you. So Simon, what's in store for us? Thank you, Robin. Uh, tonight we are in for a treat. We have two very strong teams who have taken this very seriously. I heard that Andrew Hayne even got a haircut yesterday, <laughs> uh, specifically for this debate. So. For the affirmative, we have Associate Professor Germaine Wong from the University of Sydney. She's an expert in cancer epidemiology and kidney disease. Also for the affirmative, we have Associate Professor Anne Cust, University of Sydney's cancer epidemiology expert. And last but not least on that team, we have Professor Andrew Hayen with his new haircut, UTS's <laughs> Professor of Public Health and President of the Australasian Epidemiological Association. Robin, would you like to introduce the team for the negative? Definitely. So for the negative, we have Professor Mary Louise McClaws, so that's UNSW's Infectious Disease Control Expert and Hand Hygiene Expert. Um, I thought I'd throw that in. Thank you. Yeah, so you're known for that as well. Yeah. Um, Professor Alexandra Barrett, um, Sydney University's a Cancer Screening Guru and Professor of Public Health. And Professor Anthony Rogers, George Institute's Heart Disease Prevention Champion. So we have to butter him up, if you see what I did there. <laughs> butter, ching, sorry. Didn't really work, did it? <laughs> Wait for it. But thanks, Robin. Uh, so before we start the debate, Ed is going to be our timer and he has the bell. He's going to ring the bell a little ding at five minutes. Each speaker has six minutes and then he's going to ring the bell profusely at six minutes uh, when your time is up. So it's now time to start the debate. I feel like I've been waiting years for this debate. It has been months. Uh, our first speaker on the affirmative side is Jermaine Wong. Uh, an academic nephrologist at Westmead Hospital in Sydney. She's also Principal Research Fellow at the University of Sydney. Her main interests are cancer epidemiology, diagnostic test evaluations, decision and simulation modelling, and she has established and led and coordinated a number of large-scale population-based observational studies that assess the impacts of social determinants and outcomes in people with chronic kidney disease and kidney transplants, Using big data, Jermaine has provided novel-based evidence on the health determinants and outcomes associated with chronic kidney disease. Uh, okay, I'll stop. Tonight, Jermaine is debating for the affirmative on are observational studies obsolete? Everyone, please welcome Jermaine to the stage. Thank you, Simon. 
So are observational studies obsolete? This is the question that we're going to ask ourselves today. Now there are two views currently existing in medical research. Obviously there's discovery research and evaluation of this discovery. These two views have led to extremes of the study designs and hierarchy of the study designs. Discovery research often exists in the context of observational studies. It is sometimes exciting because often new ideas are being developed, um, the newer detection of new association, the etiology and prognoses of the disease, etc, etc, etc. Then the next wave of researchers will come along and try to verify this idea and associations and perform multiple different types of comparisons, subgroup analyses, vary in the different definition of exposures, whilst accounting for the potential confounders and all the biases that are involved in an observational studies. The researchers then quickly publish the results which may or may not be contradictory or confirmatory of the previous findings. If not, then more observational studies are going to be generated and needed to bring the controversy into resolution. In most cases, researchers will use existing data such as retrospective study, data linkage, hospital records, or even some of them will use genomic Y analyses, but merely try to find an association of interest. However, a true and well-powered Perspective observational study is rarely done because it's a massive undertaking for researchers simply to confirm or refute something that may or may not be relevant for our patients. Patients do not need more studies to tell them they have a problem. For example, for kidney patients, they don't have to have 500 different observational studies to tell them they're at risk of heart disease, of cancer, of infection. <coughs> they want a cure for the disease. Clinicians therefore required evidence to inform the patients, the caregivers, the stakeholders that an intervention of interest will save lives from cancer, from cardiovascular disease, from a kidney disease, from transplantation. This can only be achieved in the context of a randomised controlled trial. And in daily clinical practice, the decision to treat or use an intervention often is such as a type of drug or even the dosage of the drugs is dependent upon the prognosis and the outcome of this patient. The worse the outcomes, the more drugs you give, the longer you give the patient, and hopefully it is the right one. And this will inevitably lead to the intractable, inevitable confounding by indication in observational studies. So the only way to effectively eradicate this bias is through randomization and concealment. Randomization is the only method that will ensure the outcomes for the benefits and the adverse effects we observed are not due solely by chance. And there are so many examples in medicine which the results of an observational studies have completely overturned by a randomized control trial. The fundamental problem with observational studies is that it does not allow us to establish a causality, but merely an association. The inability to conclusively establish a causal relationship is problematic because it has led to many different inconclusive recommendations about the utility of many interventions to date, and particularly in the context of chronic kidney disease, the EPO story is a classic example. Observational studies in hemodialysis patients have found that anemia is to be associated with high mortality in the vast majority of our patients, particularly with a hemoglobin of, say, less than 80. And subsequent to these, and over time, there are a huge number of studies assessing the concepts of anemia avoidance using erythropoietin in the context of dialysis and end-stage kidney disease, and have shown some improvement in quality of life and potentially benefits in survival compared to those who have not used the agent. This even occur at a higher hemoglobin and hematocrit level. However, this finding was completely invalidated, invalidated by at least five large randomized control trials published not showing that there were no benefits at all but substantial harms including a high risk of cardiovascular related death and stroke amount patients with high hemoglobin targets. So, often observational researchers seem to assume that there is sufficient to enter a large amount of potential confounders into some form of ridiculous statistical model and that everything is left by the way of what we observe with an exposure will be an estimate of the association. We know that this is not the case. Despite the use of novel statistical modelling such as propensity scoring, many of these confounding 
founders are insufficiently known or quantifiable and this will lead to major biases as we all know including survival, information bias and the use of missing data in appropriate categories not to mention errors and biases associated with overfitting, overadjustment, inappropriate modelling, etc, etc, etc. So in conclusion, we cannot trust observations to draw conclusion. Observations by itself provide insufficient value of the treatment itself. Therefore, under the principles of science, experimental studies in the form of randomised control trial should therefore be the judge of the truth. biased first up talk. <laughs> Sorry, the jokes don't get any better from me, I'm afraid. <laughs> so next up, um, for the negative, we have Professor Mary Louise McClaws. So Mary Louise is um, Professor of Epidemiology, do you want me to carry on, of Healthcare Associated Infection and Infection Control. But shall I cut that short and just talk about one of my favourite things about Mary Louise? Yeah. Yeah. So in her office, she's got a, a lava lamp. And it's the best thing just to go and sit in there and observe. On my couch. Do you like how I did that? Yeah. On the couch, observe <laughs> the lava lamp. Thank you. <laughs> we like to watch. <laughs> now, that's like a waste of time. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, well, Jermaine. Well, obsolete. <laughs> I'd like to suggest from your very um, impressive CV that in fact you should be on our side. <laughs> and for those of you who were dismissed by the modelling, you know, statement, most of you would be out of a job. So, with that, as true epidemiologists, our team enjoys refuting and we are going to refute those on the affirmative. <laughs> You'd think our team, you know, screening, cardiovascular, infectious diseases, we'd be worshipping at the altar of experimental design. You know, it's gorgeous. It controls the confounders so beautifully that you'd think the hand of God, or maybe David Last, perhaps, or NHMRC, is <laughs> guiding <laughs> it. Right. But no, I'm not going to do that because it's wrong. <laughs> By the end of this talk, you are going to be on my side because in your heart of heart, you know that RCTs are full of problems. Now, I don't know if you've just read the New England Journal of Medicine and the previous director of the CDC, the CDC in Atlanta, Georgia, Georgia said RCTs were poor external validity so severely restricting generalizability that the results can hardly be generalized outside of the study population. Commonly insufficient study duration for measuring the effect. Now, we baby boomers, if they had have done an RCT looking at immunization for whooping cough, they would have missed out that we now get whooping cough after 50 years after being immunized. But no, you just do an RCT and think you've got all the answers. Oh no. So this guy goes on for a little bit longer. Insufficient duration of sample size to identify rare but serious adverse effects. And lastly, the cost. But of course, our affirmative friends here are full of money. Full of money. <laughs> but I'm not going to dwell on that, no. I'd rather, I'm going to talk about three main issues. Look, I can count, I'm an epidemiologist. Three main <laughs> issues. If there's anything wrong with observational studies, it's we, the teachers, we've been obsessed with the idea of the highest quality of evidence has to come from RCTs. We are to blame for their misunderstanding. <laughs> what can I say? Time, it's time, not the, de not the design that ruins the truth and changes it. And the mantra, of course, of the lovely Les Irwig was here, the mantra of is it feasible and is it ethical? So let me start. A bit of fun. Let's have the absurdity of doing everything of this group wanted by RCTs. Oh, can you imagine? It's incredible. So let me set the scene for you. Remember the original Hippocratic Oath and whatsoever 
I shall see or hear in the course of my profession, as well as outside my profession, if it be what should not be published abroad, I will never divulge or hold such a thing wholly secret. In other words, if it ain't published, you don't know about it, or maybe we should keep things secret. Well, David McQueen from CDC agreed. He just recently published an editorial that said that we are obsessed with this publication need for causality and evidence. And why are we obsessed with it? Because it's all about RCTs. So, I say, if the truth was a mountain on the landscape of our epidemiological landscape, it's time that would erode truth, not design alone. So, Karl Wunderlich. We all remember Karl Wunderlich, don't we? He was the guy that told us that our temperature was 37 degrees. Sadly, he got it wrong. It was an observational study, but it wasn't his fault. It wasn't, well, it kind of was, but it wasn't the observational study design's fault. It was his lousy technology and his misunderstanding of physiology. So, I say to you that time erodes truth, not design. His observational design was not the problem. His lack of understanding physiology was. So, let me set a scene for you about whether or not we do an RCT. So, Rivers et al. designed a beautiful method of identifying and treating patients with sepsis, early sepsis. So I'm thinking to myself, Sir Bradford Hill, he says oh, I have to redo things in populations, time, and oh, methods, hmm, and causality. I know, maybe I should do an RCT. So we enroll a whole bunch of EDs into the passive arm, let's just check patients as we normally do into ED, and if you've got sepsis, you sit there quietly deteriorating, right? But the other arm of the trial has the new Rivers et al. Um, way of doing things, the new pathway. And if your mum comes into that pathway, good. If she's had a UTI and she's elderly and her blood pressure drops. <laughs> Fortunately, we took no notice <laughs> of that bell. And we did a before and after and won the NJA prize for the best research. So I say unto you, remember, if it's feasible and ethical, it won't be an RCT. Thank you very much. Very, very entertaining by Mary there, thank you. Uh, we've touched on a few things there that we needed to touch on in this day and age. Truth, truth is a, is a big one. Uh, generalizability, cost, time, and, and ethics. Are there any questions from the audience for our first two speakers, just to keep them on their toes? Does anybody have a question? They're obviously for observational, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> Just observing, no, no questions? Okay, uh, it's time to introduce uh, the second speaker for the affirmative. This is an epidemiologist who heads the Cancer Epidemiology and Prevention Research Group based at Sydney School of Public Health at the University of Sydney. And I'd like to welcome Anne to the stage. Please welcome Anne to the stage. Thank you, and thank you, Mary Louise. Look, you know, don't you feel sorry for that team? I mean, they're, they're really stuck in the past. I mean, just, just look at the average age of their team. <laughs> Compared to our team. I mean, they're, they're clinging to the premise that observational studies are, you know, the be all and end all, but they have to move on and realize that, you know, again, with the modern world, it's intervention studies. That's what we need these days. They're, they're just stuck in the past. <clears throat> and, you know, she talks about external validity and generalizability, but without internal validity, who cares if it's generalizable? Um, and time, I'm, I'm not quite sure what time erodes the truth actually means, so can anyone else explain that to me? Um, but look, 
if if they were sort of up to date with the you know the literature, they would know that you know it's not just a parallel design RCT anymore. There's lots of new designs that you know take into account all these factors of time and ethics. So what about the stepped wedge um, randomised controlled trial design? That's a pragmatic trial design. Um, this is commonly used for the evaluation of service delivery and policy interventions delivered at the level of the cluster. And what it means is that everyone ends up with the intervention, it's just randomly allocated when they receive that. So it gets rid of the issue of time, it gets rid of the issue of narrow uh, eligibility criteria, you know, it, they need to get with the program. So let me talk about uh, some of the other reasons for why observational studies are obsolete. One of the main reasons is it's been shown that there's a really low likelihood that given any finding from a public published observational study, uh, that, that that result is true. And this has been shown in many papers now. So why should we be concerned about that? Well, it means that clinical practice is often being driven by uh, false positive results from observational studies. So let me give you a well-known example of the Nurses' Health Study. So this is led by researchers at Harvard University. It's one of the largest, longest, and most influential observational studies internationally. So it began in 1976, and it's been uh, subsequently followed more than 100,000 women over several decades. They've had at least 38 papers from this cohort published in the New England Journal of Medicine alone. So in 2014, Ty and colleagues from the University of Auckland performed a systematic review of findings from the Nurses' Health Study and found over 2,000 associations have been reported between health outcomes and independent variables. And the majority of these have reported statistically significant but weak associations. And when they looked at the results for these associations compared to those tested in RCTs, or randomised controlled trials, they found less than 25% concordance between the Nurses' Health Study and RCT results. So three quarters of observational studies, uh, of, of the results from the Nurses' Health Study, are not correct. And this is driving our clinical practice, <coughs> our health services. Um, so let's have a closer look at a well-known example that most of you would have heard of. That's of hormone replacement therapy use and cardiovascular di disease. So for decades, observational studies showed that hormone replacement therapy reduced the risk of coronary heart disease. And so all these postmenopausal women were being given HRT for their menopausal symptoms and in the mistaken belief that it was going to reduce their risk of heart disease. And then a couple of large randomised controlled trials then showed no benefit or even maybe a small increase in heart disease depending on the hormone combinations. And so the results from the observational studies have since been explained by heavy confounding owing to differences in risks between women choosing and not choosing hormone therapy whereas the results from the RCTs change practice almost overnight. Look, there's many other studies I could sh um, cite, I could be here all night showing you examples of um, a similar pattern of false results from observational studies that have been shown to be non-existent in RCTs, such as high, high, uh, HDL cholesterol and heart disease, studies of dietary or vitamin intake, the use of aspirin or statins. So I think observational studies have had their day. Based on this evidence, you must surely agree with the conclusion of Thai and colleagues from the University of Auckland that clinical practice should not be informed by observational studies. Thanks for that. I think we all agree it's another significant talk. <laughs> I know you're all here for my jokes. <laughs> so we welcome our next speaker up for the negative. Um, hopefully that's Alex Barrett. <laughs> so Alex Barrett is a professor of public health in the School of Public Health at the University of Sydney um, and recognised internationally for her research to quantify the benefits and harms, um, including overdiagnosis of screening. So hopefully we can have some benefits and harms of the debate tonight. No? <laughs> Thanks, Alex. Thank you, Robin. Uh, well, so my job is to cause a bit of harm to that side there. And um, I think I can do that because they say that observational studies must be abandoned and we must all rely on randomised trials. But clearly, that is absolute rubbish. Because no one relies on one randomised trial, right? No one. 
And that is why the highest level of evidence is a systematic review. The only problem for my friends here is that systematic reviews, even systematic reviews of randomised trials, are, guess what, observational studies. <laughs> Check <that. laughs> So, just in case you were doubting the validity of this statement, I checked with a director of one of the Cochrane Collaboration Centres and he said to me, actually, it does give me a bit of a feeling of a sting of being offended that an observational study can be at the top of the hierarchy of evidence. <laughs> but, in my opinion, it is absolutely correct. So, if you guys are really saying that systematic reviews are obsolete, then I think someone should tell the Cochrane Collaboration. <laughs> because I can tell you they're putting them out at a huge rate. And they could all go on holidays and they could stop worrying about all those edicts from the Gray Working Group, which must drive them completely spare. But that won't happen because observational studies are clearly not obsolete. So obsolete means no longer in use or out of date. Well, as of yesterday, there were 7,000 systematic reviews on the Cochrane website, on the Cochrane Library, so clearly they are uh, still in use. But I want to show you that observational studies are not just not uh, obsolete, they are, in fact, essential to the health research endeavour. And I hate to break it to you, but there is a world outside clinical medicine. <laughs> there are questions other than what pills do we give our patients? So I'm going to start with the question, what is the frequency of this disease? As you all know, my research is in cancer, and one of the building blocks of epidemiology is, of course, incidence data. Well, where do we get incidence data about cancer? No prizes for that. Cancer registry. Well, what is a cancer registry, if not an endless series of observational studies? And where would we be without those incidence data? We would be nowhere. We would miss trends like in Korea when they just recently saw a 15-fold increase in the incidence of thyroid cancer. We would miss the trends here. There's been a doubling in the risk in the incidence of prostate cancer, breast cancer, and tripling of thyroid cancer. So we need those data. Those changes are really worth knowing about, and they're certainly not out of date. And by the way, those incidence data give us something really valuable as well. They give us baseline risk. Why do we need baseline risk? So that when we get the relative risks, we know what baseline risk in the population that we're interested in we um, can apply to. So without those kinds of data collection, we'd all really be in trouble. So I've got a few other things in here that I want to show you. <laughs> Okay, so next up, what is this? Anyone want to hazard a guess? It's actually asbestos. <laughs> okay, so it's not real asbestos. <laughs> but it looks a lot like the loose fill asbestos that was pumped into the roofs of houses in Canberra, right? Where they made this wonderful ad. This is an ad for uh, loose fill asbestos. It's fantastic stuff. It uh, is a mineral wool. It's a virgin fibre. And it lasts forever. <laughs> the only problem is, huh, maybe it gives you mesothelioma. But wait, how do we know that? Oh yeah, we did an observational study. And we found out that occupational exposure to asbestos is really bad for you. But what about if you have it in your roof space? Does that matter? Maybe it doesn't matter. But I'm here to tell you that a study was just published this year that showed that there is a measurable increase in mesothelioma cases amongst people who have lived in the Mr. Fluffy houses. So where would we be without that observational study? Tell you what, with it, 700 houses so far have been demolished in Canberra. So this is not a question of a study design that is out of date or no longer in use. This is like with us now, giving us critically important public health information. Lastly, I want to talk about questions of intervention. Now these questions, I agree, are ideally answered by randomised trials. But here's a really curious observation. When we started cervical <coughs> cancer screening, and that has been a huge winner for public health, we did it on the basis of what? <coughs> Observational studies, not a randomised trial in sight. And it's been fantastic. 
Meanwhile, we've had now nine randomised trials of breast cancer screening, and where are we? We're in a hell of a mess. <laughs> Nobody knows whether it works, and it's much the same for prostate cancer screening. In fact, cancer screening is such a contested space that Russ Harris, who's a senior investigator with the US Preventive Services Task Force, has actually been calling now for agreed standards for observational studies for monitoring cancer screening because randomised trials are no use. He says, a randomised trial is not useful for monitoring cancer screening. Ecological and cohort studies are the most appropriate study designs for monitoring cancer screening. So, I'll leave it with you. Essential, not outdated, and absolutely not obsolete. Thank you, Alex. So Alex argued that about the hierarchy of evidence putting observational studies at the top, talked about incidence data and its importance uh, with the example of the cancer registries, even pulled out some props, not, not asbestos. I thought it was marshmallows. I thought that, that was going to be good. I wanted to eat that. Uh, and I, then I thought she was going to bring out some puppets, but didn't see any puppets. Still, it was a convincing argument. And on that note, it's time for me to introduce the final slide, Professor Andrew Hayen, UTS's Professor of Public Health and President of the Australasian Epidemiological Association. Andrew is a biostatistician and he's a Professor of Public Health in the Faculty of Health at UTS. He's a coordinator of the Master of Public Health course and a member of the Discipline of Public Health. He graduated uh, with first class <laughs> honours from the University of Sydney and with a university medal in mathematical statistics and a Master of Biostatistics and a PhD in mathematical statistics. I won't say statistics anymore, but please <laughs> welcome Andrew Hayen to the stage. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. That actually um, helps with my first prop. <clears throat> Can anyone read what this folder says? Important statistics. This is actually a replica of something that Professor, the venerable Professor McClaws gave me when I dropped by her office one day. Now, I'll open this up. So Mary Louise is an observational epidemiologist. I don't think she'll deny that. In her career, so Mary Louise graduated, I looked it up today, 1992 from her PhD. So 25 years ago. This is the sum total of, of important statistics that Mary Louise has collected in her career from observational studies. I, I can almost rest my case. However, let me get on to Professor Barrett. Now, <clears throat> Professor McClaws said that any misunderstandings on our side are actually a fault of our epidemiology teachers. Well, Professor Barrett was actually my epidemiology <laughs> But, <laughs> let me read something to you, and I'd like you to guess the provenance of this statement. And we need to do randomised, this is in italics, trials, because more than ever we need gold medal evidence. 20 years of observational studies has proved that obs observational studies are just not good enough to answer our fundamental questions about modern screening. <laughs> Would anyone hazard a guess <laughs> about the author of that? <laughs> Growing uncertainty about breast cancer screening, Alexandra Barrett, University of Sydney. <laughs> In the august conversation. <laughs> So much has been made about um, the changing status of my hair today. I think that's actually misclassification. Um, I had a fight with a lawnmower, to be precise. <laughs> now, does anyone here have a pet dog? No one has? Only one person has a pet dog here. Oh, no, there's a few. Well, unfortunately, you've got 3.5 times the relative risk of developing breast cancer than among those who don't have a pet dog. Now, I know there's one cat person, Robin. Is there, are there any other cat people or people around cats? Well, you're at increased risk of leukaemia. Does anyone have a pet bird? A little parrot or a budgie or something? Oh, well, sorry, you're at increased risk of lung cancer. But look, just to calm your nerves, you might be okay because observational studies have also shown 
that cat, dog, and bird owners actually at decreased risk of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. <laughs> Observational studies can prove whatever you like. Are potatoes good for you? Who knows? Uh, <clears throat> you know, it doesn't matter what you talk about, observational studies can prove whatever you like. So I typed in cancer risk into, this is just to show the rigorous research that I've done for tonight, into the Google today. So I learned a startling thing. Men with beards have a lower risk of facial skin cancers than men without beards. I mean, who would have thought that? But you can also see um, people with higher cholesterol have lower breast cancer risk. That was published in an observational study this week. Um, but also, in the same week, there was an RCT showing statins could reduce breast cancer incidence. The Gnosis Health study that Anne referred to said that women who live in areas with high nighttime light exposure had a 14% increased risk of breast cancer compared to women who live in areas with low nighttime light exposure. I mean, we could just go on all night. Now, Robin, I'm going to put you on the spot. What did you have for lunch last week? Last Thursday? Food. Yeah, but what kind of food? <laughs> food that you can eat. Yeah, OK. Yeah. So that's probably about as good as a lot of epidemiological studies in their assessments of diet. <laughs> People had food. Oh, food's a risk factor for dying. Now, Alex brought up asbestos. I mean, Alex, seriously, she's living in the 1980s. Asbestos has been known to be a risk factor for mesothelioma for 30, 40 years. What are the major findings of observational studies in recent years? I don't know any. Like, what are the big findings? What are the major findings of public health? Smoking, 1950s. So, um, the Dole and Bradford Hill reports. The Surgeon General report in the 60s. Your Brinner, whatever you do, don't smoke in the late 1980s. Skin cancer. We've known since Oliver Lancaster was a professor um, at the University of Sydney in the 1950s. Exercise. Hippocrates actually told us that exercise is needed for good health. Even the Wombles of Wimbledon, does anyone remember them? <laughs> They had a song, exercise is good for you, laziness is not. <laughs> Mary Louise is an expert in hand hygiene. I mean, whose mother didn't tell you to wash your hands before dinner? <laughs> I mean, seriously, this is... <laughs> what are all the new findings of observational studies? Sure, they might have been good 20 years ago, 30 years ago, for things that had a relative risk of 20 or whatever, but not these ridiculous studies that we see every week. Something increases your risk of disease X by 0.1% and so on. Observational studies. Who remembers Kodak films? Does anyone still use them? No. VCRs, floppy disks, penny farthings, the Leyland P76, section 44 of the Constitution. That is what we are talking about tonight. Observational studies are obsolete. <laughs> Thank you, Andrew, for that confident, or should I say 95% confident. <laughs> <laughs> so we have our final speaker for the negative, Anthony Rogers. And he has a track record of research in cardiovascular disease prevention, innovation and public-private partnerships. Um, and he's currently acting director of the cardiovascular division at the George Institute Australia. And I could keep reading, but somewhere in the middle here, it talks about a large clinical trial program. Perhaps I should stop. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thank you very much, speaker. And um, I may not take all the time because. Um, uh, my previous speaker has led me on so nicely to the main points that I was going to make. Um, but perhaps initially I'll just rebut some of the issues and um, my co-speakers in particular about the age comment. Uh, that, can't, <laughs> that can't go unaddressed. Um, and the second speaker made a, quite a rapid observational study, I would say, about the age of uh, their opponents. Um, and it is true. You... The opponents are closer to the smashed avocado generation. <laughs> um, so we'll accept the inference that you made from that observational study. 
one of the criticisms of that generation is not doing the homework. And um, <laughs> it appears you haven't either about looking at what the question was. So it's not whether randomized trials are better than observational studies, it's whether observational studies are obsolete. Um, and you seem to be persisting in that uh, world view. Um, and so a great pleasure to, to address that directly. Um, and my last speaker made the point that, you know, basically, what have they done for me lately? Um, <laughs> the history of epidemiology, the great advances, has all been observational studies, right from Jon Snow, uh, finding out about hand washing, learning about lung cancer, that's all observational studies. But I think what they're trying to say is that there's no new important risks in the world. Um, or, or maybe they are, or maybe they aren't. So uh, that, I would say, is the fundamental question. Are there any new risks in the world? And, and I'd really like to get the panel's opinion on this. Um, I mean, there's a very simple yes-no question. Um, so and it, there's actually quite a lot of people who are thinking there's no new risks. Um, so climate change is one of the great big new risks. As far as I'm aware, that my previous may know, there's never been a randomized trial of warming planets before. <laughs> That's entirely observational evidence. And uh, they seem to be aligning their methodological interpretation with some other people who doubt the results <laughs> of observational studies. Uh, recent leaders, current leaders, are very much in doubt of that fact. A recent leader of this country, a current leader of the US, are very much aligned with our panel <laughs> um, about the uncertainty associated with observational studies. And they also have views about marriage equality and vaccination safety, and, but that's a cross-sectional analysis of their opinions and I, I won't um, imply that that was useful or that you may also have those opinions. <laughs> those do. Um, but, so th that's one, you, you may think there's no new risks and you may be in that camp. Um, but on the other side, you may think there may be um, important new risks. And uh, this is when I thought I'd bring out my props. Um, so Australia has a very interesting and proud tradition in this area where there, there may be a new risk that we're uncertain of. And we're all very familiar with the, um, the Marshall example where they weren't certain whether there'd be a new risk. And so he took the soup of H. pylori himself. And so presumably this is what our panel are proposing. If there's a possible new risk, then they'll do a randomized trial of exposure to that new risk. And I'm, I'm, I'm very impressed with the dedication to that methodologically strength, strong paradigm. Um, so, uh, my colleagues are an infectious disease, um, so we got a couple of specimens here of a possible <laughs> virus. Um, there'd have been a bunch of pigs and chickens and humans living together and everyone's getting sick. So some of it's the blood from one and another's the control blood. So I don't know which it is, so I'll, I'll give you some later to do a randomized <laughs> trial. Um, and, and I'm sure if you'd stick to your point, you would, you would take that. Um, <laughs> now, another interesting possible new risk, uh, as you may know, pa plastics are becoming incredibly common um, in our environment. They don't dissolve, they just break down into smaller and smaller particles. Um, I got some of them here. Um, and interesting, once they get in the bloodstream, in the, in the water supply, they've got estrogen-like um, uh, capabilities or properties, and many people think that's related to why sperm counts have been going down over the years. And so we've got to think here, we, we've only got one male protagonist here. <laughs> so uh, what I'd like to propose is an end of one trial where we're eating these on and off for um, for a few years. I'll have a line of your cocaine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, 
interesting design um, that I had to get through the ethics committee, but you're free to go with, uh, <laughs> with that outcome measurement, and uh, we won't, we'll put the ca cameras off for that part. So, uh, in conclusion, I'd just like the audience to ask whether they believe there'll be any new risks in the world, and whether they'll align themselves with, with that viewpoint, um, and if so, um, then observational studies are obsolete, but if not, I, I think we I think we still need. Thank you, Anthony. Talking about new risks in the world. Did the climate just change in here? <laughs> what What is the relative risk of losing this debate? Do you think um, blood was definitely shed? Uh, but I'm just an unbiased observer here. Uh, I wouldn't sit on any side. But soon you'll get to vote through your claps as to who is the winner of this debate. But before we do that, we're going to let the final, sorry, the first speakers do a two minute wrap up uh, from each side. So I'd like to introduce Jermaine again to the stage. Please welcome Jermaine to the stage for a two minute wrap up. <coughs> Wow, that was an interesting debate. Um, look, observational study is obsolete for the various reasons, and randomized control trial is the reference standard for all for all research. Um, not because our randomized control trials researchers are younger and more attractive and have a new haircut, <laughs> and apart from that, we attract a lot more money, as we all know from the NHMLC, um, but we need intervention trials to actually get intervention onto the PBAC to get funding for the patients and to involve and in, in, in uh, informed care for our patients. Um, Professor Rogers alluded to the N01 study, which is clearly an observational study, but in effect it is actually a N01 trial by definition. Um, hence, um, and, and the other issues related to observational studies are, um, you know, we ran on, it's a fishing exercise. So largely based upon huge amount of data, um, using cluster analyses, using extensive modeling, so, um, <coughs> As we all know, that garbage in equals to garbage out. Um, so, effectively, um, this is uh, observational studies are largely uh, false results in general. Um, randomized controlled trial is the way to go. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, we're nearing the end now. We did, we did have discussions before the debate about whether we should randomise the order of the speakers. <laughs> I've decided not to. So we welcome <laughs> Mary Louise to put in her final arguments. Oh, look. The exuberance and arrogance of youth. Not understanding about how time changes our understanding of risk. You know, sometimes things are discovered, but they are so new into this world that they think everything's been discovered and that nothing happened before. Now, I have to tell you, with age comes wisdom, and Alex severely, absolutely unreservedly apologises for her arrogance when she was just a youth. <laughs> now, we also understand that alcohol and guns kill. <laughs> so, if you really believe in a randomised control trial, which one would you like? <laughs> which one kills the fastest? Do you want the alcohol? Oh no, let's randomise it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, ah oh yes, well, they say that there are limitations about observational studies, but I put it to you. Saying that it's really about the quality of the statistician, not the, <laughs> the, the confounders. Oh, yes. And in fact, after tonight, I, I love Section 18C, the hate speech one. I think I'm going to have to report all of them. <laughs> because we all know that without observational studies, 
we wouldn't be rushing into an RCT about hormone replacement therapy. You have to use observational studies to be able to find that, in fact, it was probably a clanger anyway, instead of you know, doing the time-consuming, unethical randomized control trial. So I leave it to you people. Most of you will get into teaching, academia. Do you want a job? If you want a job, you'll support <laughs> observational studies. Because it's all about observational studies. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mary Louise. Finishing with a bang there. Uh, it's terrible, isn't it? Thanks for teaching me that. Uh, <laughs> Are there any questions from the audience? I mean, you're going to have to decide in a moment who has won this debate, but maybe there's still some questions left in your mind that you need clarifying. Have a think about it. Is there any, does anyone have any questions? <clears throat> no one's willing to intervene. <laughs> Okay, I think we've wait, oh, waited. Come on, oh, God. Yeah, I know. <laughs> okay, well, it's now time for you, the audience, to decide who has won this evening's debate. So, first of all, can we have a big round of applause for our fantastic speakers? That's to get your clapping hands warmed up. Um, so, which team tickled your fancy? Have the affirmatives convinced you to always randomise? Or would you rather sit back with the negatives and observe? So what we'll do first is we'll put it to a vote and then you have to clap and cheer for the team that you want to win. And whichever gets the most noise obviously is going to win. So if you want the affirmative to win... Are we allowed to vote? <laughs> <laughs> if you want the affirmative to win, clap and cheer now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah! <laughs> it's so <laughs> and if you want the negative to win, clap and cheer now. Well, I think that's unanimous. Almost. Almost unanimous. <laughs> it's just an <laughs> outlier. <laughs> Okay, well that was, that was really entertaining. Uh, so there we have it, the winner is uh, the negative team. Congratulations to the negative team. But thank you to all of the debaters tonight, really appreciate that, it's so entertaining. Uh, and we have some small gifts for you. So we can do a randomised controlled trial with the, oh, they're all the same. No, no, no one's taking my boy. <laughs> Thank you. And you get some as well. It's very healthy. Thank you. Yeah, there were some really thought provoking arguments tonight, so thank you, thank you for those. And thank you to the audience. You've all been great this evening. I uh, appreciate you all turning out and I hope this debate has got you thinking. For those of you who aren't members of the PHAA or AEA, I'd encourage you to go and have a look at our websites. They're great organisations and a great way to meet like-minded professionals like yourselves. A uh, really good way to, to expand your professional network. I also want to thank all of the people who helped organise this evening. Uh, it was a big effort. Would you like to thank those? Um, probably? Yep. So, um Thank you obviously to UTS for providing the space and then Nicole Brun who's sitting here, we've got a gift for her as well, who has put in a huge amount of effort because the event got a bit larger than we were expecting and she had to redo all the room bookings at short notice so, and I know that wasn't a small job to do. And also to Elizabeth Sullivan, Sullivan, the Director of the Australian Centre for Public Health and Population Health Research, who funded the um, equipment that we needed to do all the audio and that. And a big thanks to Sun Bin, who isn't with us right now, but I think she's streaming in online. She couldn't be here, but she was here earlier setting all of this up, and she did a huge amount of work to, to organise this event, as well as Alvin Lee, who's sitting down here in, in the corner. Uh, Alvin did a, a huge job of organising the event as well, and Catriona Bonfiglioli is the communications uh, officer with the PHAA, and she's done a great job. And particularly thank you to Andrew Hayen as well, who 
uh, chipped in for organising the event and, and even got a haircut, so he took it very seriously. <laughs> uh, thank you all for coming along tonight and we look forward to seeing you at future events. Cheers. Thank you. And thanks to those online.